The term creepypasta was coined on 4chan around 2007 to describe short online horror stories that could be easily copy and pasted around the internet. The genre experienced a huge boom in popularity around the late 2000s to the early 2010s and since then it's enjoyed many many years of widespread popularity. These days the term creepypasta encompasses basically anything and everything from urban legends and chain letters to ARGs to short horror fiction and poetry to good old campfire story spooks. Today we're going to start our journey into the creepy pasta iceberg which collates a ton of different creepypastas and ranks them by how well known they are. At the top of the iceberg we have the most iconic and well known pastas and at the very bottom are more obscure and esoteric stories. I'm super excited to jump in, especially to this first layer since all the most classic iconic creepypastas can be found here in all their silly 2010s glory. So sit back, relax and grab yourself a bowl of piping hot pasta because today we're diving into the creepypasta iceberg part 1. Before we jump into things, I just want to give a huge thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring this video. If you want to make a website for literally anything you can think of, Squarespace is there for you. They have hundreds of award-winning templates for all kinds of sites, so even if you can't code, there are tons of visually stunning options. Set up a storefront for your small business with tons of third-party extensions that can help you promote products, streamline bookkeeping, manage inventory, handle sales tax, and ship items across the globe. Squarespace is also great for portfolio sites and galleries, with many different ways to display your images and videos videos including video libraries and pages. Plus with analytics you can use insights to see where your website visits and sales are coming from to grow your business and marketing strategies. Basically whatever you want to make Squarespace will help you do it. Storefronts, portfolios, projects, newsletters, the options are literally endless. Go to squarespace.com for a free trial and when you're ready to launch go to squarespace.com slash izzies that's squarespace.com slash izzzyzzyz to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. A huge thank you to Squarespace for sponsoring this video and now let's dive into the creepypasta iceberg part 1. Before we start delving into the cold, deep depths of the spooky iceberg, I just want to explain a couple of things about it first. There's a super wide variety of creepypastas on this list, from old classics to video game and lost episode creepypastas to Reddit no sleep stories to terribly written cringe fest to genuinely interesting works of horror fiction and more. For the creepypastas that have interesting histories or backstories or have influenced internet culture, I'll be diving into that since that's what I tend to find most interesting. But if an entry on the iceberg doesn't have much information about it or does doesn't have much history, I'll just give a brief run through of the story. This iceberg will contain some discussion of disturbing topics, however in order to please YouTube's algorithm we won't be talking about anything gruesome in too much detail and any really disturbing or graphic entries will be very briefly mentioned or even skipped altogether. It's also worth noting that there are a few ARG slash unfiction stories on here, I know they don't technically count as creepypasta necessarily but they're on here and they're fun to talk about. Just because I know if I don't mention it all of the hardcore creepypasta fans are going to be arguing semantics in the comments and I don't think any of us want that. <laughs> Finally I'd like to give a huge thanks to reddit user Avag Skeletorium for creating this creepypasta iceberg and a link to the original will be included in the description below. Without further ado let's get into part 1 of the creepypasta iceberg. Slenderman. If you've been online in any way, shape, or form in the last like 10 years, you're probably already pretty familiar with who Slenderman is, so I'll keep this one short. Slenderman was created in 2009 on the Something Awful forums by a user called Victor Surge, now known by his real name, Eric Knudsen. Slenderman was depicted as an unnaturally tall and, well, slender humanoid creature with a black suit and a featureless white face, as well as long tendrils that extended from his back. He was said to stalk his victims, often children, driving them mad and even turning them into his proxies, basically evil minions who would do his bidding. Slenderman took on a life of its own beyond Eric Knudsen's writings on the Something Awful forums, becoming a pop cultural icon and the star of countless games, parody videos, memes, and B-grade movies. However, Slenderman's enormous popularity was greatly diminished in 2014 when a 12-year-old girl in Waukesha, Wisconsin was nearly killed by two classmates who were trying to sacrifice her to the Slenderman. A moral panic occurred over the character and the effects of creepypasta on young minds. 
lines, and while this public outcry did eventually die down, the Slender Man mythos never quite reached those same levels of fame as it once had. Tiki Toby Leading on from the last entry, Tiki Toby is a Slender Man fan character who became so popular that he was unofficially officially adopted by the fans into the Slender Man canon. Toby is one of Slender Man's proxies and is basically your standard evil sadistic killer with a sarcastic quirky sense of humour and a tortured backstory. And also he happens to be a cute anime boy so 13 year olds can make a lot of fan art of him, mostly shipping him with other popular creepypasta boys. I think in retrospect the main thing that sets Tiki Toby apart from his contemporaries is the weirdly offensive use as Tourette's as like a spooky character trait. From the original Tiki Toby creepypasta published in 2013 on DeviantArt by user Castaway, quote, The other major disorder he had faced, which was the one that deemed him many insulting nicknames in the short time he attended grade school before he switched to homeschooling, was his Tourette's syndrome, which caused him to tick and twitch in ways that he couldn't control. He would crack his neck uncontrollably and twitch every once in a while. The kids would tease him and call him Tiki Toby and they mocked him with exaggerated twitching and laughing. I don't have Tourette's so I guess I can't really comment on whether you should or should not be offended by this so you know people that have Tourette's sound off in the comments. Tiki Toby offensive or just plain silly. Eyeless Jack. Eyeless Jack aka Jack aka EJ aka the heir of Chernobog according to the wiki <laughs> is a creepypasta character created in 2012 by creepypasta wiki user Azel5000. To quote the villains wiki which I'm embarrassed to even admit that I used as a source in this video quote at the age of 19 Jack Nyris was once a normal human of American origin before he was used by a cult as a human sacrifice which involved the removal of his eyes and a liquid mixture of hot tar and blood being poured into his sockets. The sacrifice failed, however resulting in the ritual accidentally turning Eyeless Jack into the eldritch kidney eating monster that he is now. The funniest thing about Eyeless Jack to me personally is that you look up fan art of him and he's always this hot sad boy with fluffy hair and an oversized sweater and a blue mask that he's sadly peeking out from. And then you look at the original creepypasta image and it's this. <laughs> the dude looks like a thumb. Laughing Jack Continuing the trend of insert verb here Jack names, Laughing Jack is a creepypasta character that rose to prominence basically solely by virtue of having a cool design that was fun to draw. In the creepypasta of the same name, Laughing Jack was a lovable imaginary friend who became the companion of a little boy in the 1800s. He appeared as a colourful jack-in-the-box toy who was always smiling and cheerful. That is, until the little boy forgot about him and grew up to become a cold-blooded killer. The combination of being abandoned and corrupted by the boy's evil influence turned Laughing Laughing Jack hashtag evil and hashtag scary as all his colours disappeared and he took on a frightening demonic appearance. I'm sure that you can guess how the story goes from here, Laughing Jack becomes a creepy spooky killer clown and the anime boy fan art rolls in. Seriously, Laughing Jack is considered by many to be a part of that sort of main iconic group of creepypasta characters alongside Slender Man and Jeff the Killer and I can only assume it's because kids enjoyed making anime boy fan art of him. Actually at the end of the day, honestly that's what a lot of these creepypasta characters boil down to because kids are weird. Uh, moving on. Herobrine. Herobrine is an infamous Minecraft creepypasta character said to be the deceased brother of the game's developer, Notch. Rumours of Herobrine's existence began circulating around August of 2010 on the Minecraft forums and told of a non-playable character with a default skin and blank white eyes. This screenshot was the most widely circulated quote unquote proof of his existence at the time as the story gained popularity. Herobrine would stalk the player through the game, appearing faintly in the fog or just out of the corner of the player his eyes and strange structures would be found throughout the game world. Some even told of Herobrine crashing the game or sending them private messages on the forum telling them to stop talking about him. Of course Herobrine was just a clever hoax and a work of fiction but the easily replicated premise of the story, i.e. basically any kid can go into Minecraft wearing a Herobrine skin and take a screenshot, combined with the simple fact that a lot of Minecraft's hardcore player base are children meant that the story spread like wildfire. Notch himself eventually stepped in to confirm that Herobrine did not exist and he didn't even have a brother but this didn't stop Herobrine from reaching urban legend status not just within the Minecraft community but on the wider internet. Jeff the Killer. Alright so pretty much everyone already knows about this guy right? The story of Jeff the Killer who becomes a crazed murderer after he's disfigured by bullies has been circulating online since 2008 and it's so famous that I'm willing to bet most of you have already heard the story many times. What I find more interesting than the frankly quite poorly written creepypasta is the origin of this iconic image which is now considered lost media. Believe it or not this image is photoshopped, big shock I know, and in recent times lost media sleuths have begun hunting for the original unedited image. The early 
earliest instance of the edited Jeff image was three years before the creepypasta was written on a site called Paya.cc by user OmegaVault on November 16th, 2005. But it turns out there's an even earlier version of the image, still photoshopped but with a distinctly less scary and more goofy look. The first instance of this earlier iteration was posted on a Japanese media sharing site called fileman.n1e.jp by an anonymous user on July 24th, 2005, which you'll note was a few months before the scary Jeff edit was first posted. The caption of the post, a certain celebrity before plastic surgery, suggests that the image was being used as a meme and spread around as a joke. The original poster, Miyama, replied to a comment asking about where they found the image, writing, quote, to put it simply, in mid-2005, a cropped image of a video of a middle-aged Asian woman appeared in Japan. At that point, the face was white. I edited it a little in Photoshop to post a Paya.cc. So take from that what you will. While this does shed some light on the early origins of the image, we're no closer to finding the original unedited source image, and as Miyama has claimed that they don't have it anymore, it's fully possible that it'll just end up lost media forever. The Russian Sleep Experiment The Russian Sleep Experiment, published in late 2010, tells the fictitious story of an experiment gone wrong, which also happens to take place in Russia and have to do with sleep. Thus the name. <laughs> Five political prisoners were used as test subjects for a stimulant gas that kept them constantly awake. Though the experiment was meant to go on for 30 days, it only lasted 15 before the test subjects were driven to insanity. They began whispering to the cameras hidden throughout the room and running around screaming incoherently before eventually barricading themselves inside the test room and going silent for days on end. When the room was finally opened up, the researchers were horrified at what they found. The test subjects had begun to eat their own bodies to the point where their bones were visible all in the name of staying awake. Now terrified of even falling asleep. The test subjects who were subdued and taken to the hospital all died suddenly the moment they were put under anesthesia and fell asleep, aside from two who were to be sealed back into the stimulant gas chamber alongside three researchers. One of these researchers immediately shot the commander who gave the order, refusing to be sealed away with the sleepless creatures. He shot the two remaining test subjects as well, and this being an early creepypasta, of course the ending is super corny and overblown. Before being shot, one of the test subjects gives this like hilariously overdramatic speech. It's really great. I'll, I'll read it for you. We are you. We are the madness that lurks within you all, begging to be free at every moment in your deepest animal mind. We are what you hide from in your beds every night. We are what you sedate into silence and paralysis when you go to the nocturnal haven where we cannot tread. Like, yeah. <laughs> Uh, okay. <laughs> the Russian sleep experiment definitely has its merits. The spooky experiment gone wrong formula felt a lot fresher and more unique back then, and the premise of the experiment driving its subjects to actually fear sleep is definitely an interesting one. But for the most part, the writing is pretty basic and leans way too heavily into overly detailed and long descriptions about how gory and gross the subjects were. It's one of those it's scary because it's violent and graphic creepypastas that under the surface don't really have much substance to them to be honest. But still, it's remembered by many as an extremely iconic creepypasta. Also, fun fact, for a long time people didn't know where this image, which often accompanied the creepypasta, came from. It was eventually discovered that it was a darkened image of a Halloween prop called Spasm, so there you go. The more you know. The Smiling Man the Smiling Man is a horror story written by L. S. Riley, more commonly known as Blue Title on Reddit. In it, the author recounts their terrifying experience on a late night walk where they encountered a tall, lanky man in a suit with a cartoonishly wide grin who was dancing towards them. Unnerved, they crossed the street and attempted to put some distance between them, but the man began to follow them, eventually running at full speed with the freakish grin still pasted across his face, causing the author to flee. The Smiling Man was originally posted on r slash let's not meet, a subreddit dedicated to true stories stories of terrifying encounters before being revealed as a fictional story when it was posted to r slash no sleep. Which as a side note personally annoys me because Let's Not Meet is absolutely filled with fake stories designed to get as much karma as possible which kind of defeats the purpose of it being a subreddit for true stories. It's a real problem on that subreddit in particular but also let's be honest you didn't come to this video to hear me talk about niche subreddit politics so uh, let's move on. Dead Bart. Dead Bart is one of the most infamous early examples of a lost episode creepypasta. It was written in early 2010 by a GameFAQ user called K.I. Simpson in a thread discussing mouse.avi and this was their attempt at a similar story. And don't worry, we will be touching on that one later in the video. Dead Bart was a lost episode of The Simpsons in which Bart got sucked out of an airplane and died with hyper-realistic depictions of his body and the Simpson family grieving his loss as they became skeletally thin and visit his grave. Other hashtag spooky details are thrown in, such as the gravestones listing celebrities and their dates of death, including celebrities which are still 
still alive. One detail that I personally find super funny is that the author gets the link to the dead Bart video off of Matt Groening himself at a convention and he like writes down the URL to the download on a piece of paper and gives it to them. It's silly and overdone but at the time Lost episode creepypastas were a more new and novel concept so it was received pretty well. It helped to popularize the innocent kids franchise is actually scary genre which basically hinges on that whole childhood ruined spooky factor. Abandoned by Disney. Abandoned by Disney written by Slime Beast and submitted to the Creepypasta wiki on December 8th of 2012 tells the story of a tourist exploring an abandoned Disney resort called Mowgli's Palace. Urban exploration and abandoned building walkthroughs were super big at the time so this story sort of harps on those themes. It's actually pretty fun and engaging right up until the point where the author discovers that a haunted photo negative Mickey Mouse mascot is like haunting the park. It's pretty silly. These creepypasta stories always have to blow it in the final act with some horribly overwrought twist or corny monster and that's my creepypasta hot take. The back rooms. The back rooms as helpfully illustrated on the shirt that I'm wearing which is from a website called Vapor95 if you happen to want one by the way was created on 4chan in 2019 on the X board. It's kind of hard to believe how recent that is considering how ingrained in creepypasta and even just general internet culture the back rooms now is. Because when I say the back rooms is popular, I really do mean popular with a capital P. Popular enough to be sold on shirts. <laughs> but let's back up for a second, because what actually even is the back rooms? In the original 4chan thread, Anons were asked to post images that they found disquieting and off. One Anon replied with this image of a large empty room with yellow carpeting accompanied by this description, quote, If you're not careful and you no clip out of reality in the wrong areas, you'll end up in the back rooms where it's nothing but the stink of old moist carpet, the madness of mono yellow, the endless background noise of fluorescent lights at maximum humbuzz and approximately 600 million square miles of randomly segmented empty rooms to be trapped in. God save you if you hear something wandering around nearby because it sure as hell has heard you. Shortly after this post, others began creating and sharing stories about the backrooms on 4chan and reddit with r slash backrooms being established as a hub for fans of the creepypasta. But a divide soon split the backrooms community apart and this divide tends to be seen in a lot of creepypasta communities where the creator is anonymous. Without one definitive creator, that can make decisions on what is and what isn't canon, it's basically just a free-for-all with artists and writers piling on their own individual ideas. They then separate into two different camps, the ones who want to add on to and expand the canon to make it more complex and the purists who want to stick to the original quote-unquote canon interpretation. The Backrooms very quickly grew into a complicated multifaceted story with different levels and areas of the Backrooms, an array of monsters and creatures to inhabit them, and shady corporations and conspiracies about why and how the backrooms exist. At the end of the day it's harmless fun and I hate to be a hater but I'm kind of on the side of the purists personally. The original idea was super simple and short and that's what made it so spooky and so interesting. The idea of this creepy liminal space that stretches on forever makes you wonder what could be lurking in there and the wondering is honestly scarier than showing the monsters and coming up for explanations as to why they exist. But that's just me. The backrooms is as popular as ever with A24 even in the works to come out with a movie inspired by by the now infamous creepypasta. Sonic.exe. Despite its questionable quality, Sonic.exe is often cited as one of the most influential early video game creepypastas alongside pastas like Ben Drowned and Godzilla NES, inspiring countless other tales of haunted games and .exe files. Published to the creepypasta wiki in 2011 by a user called JC the Hyena, Sonic.exe begins with the author, Tom, receiving a package from a friend called Kyle. It contains a disc labelled Sonic.exe as well as a hastily written note begging Tom to destroy the disc. Being a good friend, Tom ignores these desperate pleas and starts up Sonic.exe, excited to play through a Sonic game and relive his childhood. He quickly discovers that the game is haunted by some malevolent entity. The Sega 1991 trademark becomes Sega 666, the ocean in the title screen looks like quote blood but hyper realistic, and an evil bloody eyed Sonic begins chasing Tom through the game. The creepypasta is basically just a long winded play by play of every level and all the creepy and spooky things that happen, and the climax of the story is that <gasps> Sonic EXE is actually IRL. After I sat there for 25 seconds, I heard a voice right behind me like a whisper. Try to keep this interesting for me, Tom. I turned around to see where the voice came from and what I saw made me scream. Sitting on my bed, staring right at me, 
was a sonic plushie smiling with bloodstains under its eyes. After the release of this story, multiple fan-made recreations of the haunted Sonic.exe games were created, some of which were played by huge YouTubers like PewDiePie and Markiplier, further popularizing the original creepypasta, Lavender Town Syndrome. Lavender Town Syndrome is a creepypasta that I, and I'm sure many of you, also fell for hook, line, and sinker as a kid. In the early 2010s, an anonymous post was made to 99chan claiming that the music in Lavender Town, a local location in the 1996 games Pokemon Red and Blue was responsible for making children sick and even driving them to outright insanity. This was blamed on the high-pitched tones and binaural beats featured in the chiptune music which only children and teenagers could hear. It was purported that listening to the song would cause headaches, nausea, disorientation, and mild to severe symptoms of mental illness. A video analyzing the song's audio was later posted to YouTube with a spectrogram output showing several unknowns spelling out the phrase leave now as well as some ghost sprites. It's been argued in recent years whether binaural beats of this nature would even be possible on the Game Boy with its limited audio capabilities, with the overwhelming consensus being that no. <laughs> Not to mention the supposed spectrogram output was obviously photoshopped and there are no records of any deaths or hospitalizations in Japan in the 1990s connected to Pokemon or binaural beats. This didn't stop me and tons of other kids from being deathly afraid of Lavender Town Syndrome though. I distinctly remember as a kid watching videos all the time that would be like, top 10 creepy Pokedex entries or top 10 creepy things in Pokemon, and if a creator was using that song, I was immediately clicking out, even if it was like a cover of the Lavender Town theme. No. <laughs> I was gone. Squidward's... thing. I'm gonna be quick about this one because YouTube doesn't like discussions of this particular topic, but Squidward's you know what, is a creepypasta revolving around a lost episode of Spongebob. It has all the classic lost episode cliches, hyper-realistic blood eyes, real images of crime spliced into the episode, and driving everyone who sees it to near madness. It also has an iconic spooky image associated with it, this edit of Squidward with bleeding red eyes. While the creepypasta gets credit for being one of the earliest of its genre, published in early 2010, it's by no means the best of its genre, and by today's standards, it's pretty goofy. Ted the Caver Ted the Caver is often cited as one of the earliest online creepypastas to gain widespread popularity and notoriety. It was launched as an Angel Fire page in early 2001 and told the story of a man called Ted who ventured into a cave that he dubbed the Mystery Cave. The story is told in a found footage slash found document format with the Angel Fire site functioning as a sort of diary for Ted as he explains through a series of blog posts what happened to him inside the Mystery Cave. Ted's experience began when he and a friend decided to make a trip to the Mystery Cave to do some spelunking whereupon they found a small fist-sized opening in the rocks which they suspected may lead to a bigger unexplored passage of the cave. Over the course of the next few days they tirelessly worked to chisel away at the opening. It was hard, slow work which wasn't helped by a mysterious windy howling noise and a low rumbling which resonated from deep within the cave. As the two men continued to work at the tiny cave opening they began to experience more and more bizarre occurrences. They heard blood-curdling screaming noises, found strange crystals and hieroglyphics inside the new passage, and a friend that they sent in to explore the cave came out pale and trembling and immediately ran out and refused to contact them afterwards. Things came to a climax during one trip when Ted descended into the cave and became overwhelmed by an intense feeling of dread as strange noises, sensations, and horrible stenches began to fill the cave. As he was escaping, he saw the rope he came up on being pulled back into the cave by some unknown force which caused the two men to flee the cave and vowed to never return. However, that vow would soon be broken as Ted uploaded a final blog entry explaining that he had been experiencing experiencing horrible nightmares and hearing strange sounds in his home, and that he felt compelled to venture back into the mystery cave for answers. He promised that he would be back with explanations for all of the strange occurrences within the cave, and signed off, love, Ted. As you may have guessed, the blog was never updated and Ted was never heard from again. This wonderful piece of horror literature, which is well worth a read by the way, has been cited by scholars on numerous occasions as an example of an extremely early and influential piece of creepypasta work. In the anthology 21st Century digital gothic, Joseph Crawford argued that Ted the Caver, quote, helped to pioneer two techniques that would become foundational to online horror fiction, the use of real-time updates and the use of hyperlinks. Real-time updates, hyperlinks, and using social media and website formats for found footage and document-style stories are a cornerstone of horror and ARG content online today, and we have Ted the Caver to thank for all of that. The Rake The Rake is a fictional creature which originated on 4chan's B-board around 2009 in a thread asking Anons to contribute ideas for a new horror monster. The results were a tall, gaunt, 
gaunt and pale humanoid creature with large glowing eyes and a mouth full of small, sharp teeth. The original creepypasta of the Wraith includes several fictional accounts of encounters with the creature dating all the way back to 1880, suggesting that this is some sort of supernatural or eldritch being with an elongated lifespan. Since its inception, the Rake has become an exceedingly popular creepypasta character featured in countless stories, games, and even a low-budget movie with 12% on Rotten Tomatoes, which honestly is how you really know that your internet horror character has made it big time. Polybius Polybius is the name of an arcade cabinet which appeared in several locations throughout Portland, Oregon in 1981. Those who played the game quickly became addicted despite suffering from a slew of symptoms such as migraines, seizures, insomnia, and nightmares, and it was purported that mysterious men in black would occasionally visit the machines to collect data. A month after they appeared, they then vanished, never to be seen again. But the legend persisted, and Polybius became one of the most infamous urban legends of all time. Now, I hate to spoil the fun on this one, but Polybius has been well and truly debunked by this point. Despite allegedly occurring in 1981, the first online mention wouldn't come until 1998 and the first printed mention came even later in 2003. It's believed that the rumour may have started due to a combination of events that happened in 1981. There were reports of two players falling ill and having to receive medical attention after playing arcade games Tempest and Asteroids respectively, and several days later the FBI actually raided several arcades in the area on suspicion of illegal activity and would subsequently begin to monitor the arcade arcade machines. It's hypothesized that these events may have led local kids and teens who frequented the arcades to spin a wild story about a government-run mind control operation in the arcades leading to the story of Polybius, which would of course spread like wildfire once it reached the internet. Nowadays Polybius has taken on a sort of internet in-joke slash meme status with countless Polybius remakes and even authentic arcade machines built and painted to replicate the legendary game. There's a fantastic video about the quest to debunk Polybius by the channel Ahoy which is very much worth checking out. Username 666. Interestingly enough, I've actually already covered username 666 on my channel in a video about old nostalgic YouTube horror, but to recap, username 666 was a YouTube channel posted by a user called Nana825763. It depicted someone adding 666 to the end of YouTube's URL and refreshing until the page became corrupted and red with disturbing clips and images filling the page. Being an extremely early example of unfiction horror, it was originally posted in February of 2008 8, username 666 became something of an urban legend and kids across the globe stayed up late at night with their friends typing 666 into the YouTube URL and refreshing over and over. Of course, the video was just a work of fiction and actually based on an entry into a horror video contest on Japanese video sharing site Nico Nico Duga or NND. Nana was and still is known as a prolific and talented horror artist, having paved the way for countless other creators in the horror ARG and unfiction field. I'm a search and rescue officer. I'm a search and rescue officer for the US Forest Service, I Have Some Stories to Tell is a now famous creepypasta series posted to the No Sleep subreddit by the appropriately named user Search and Rescue Woods. The first installment of the series has nearly 30,000 upvotes and recounts several strange incidents that occurred to the OP during their time as a SAR officer. A child climbing up a tree never to be seen again, a man nearly falling off a mountain after encountering a hiker with no face, and most infamously, staircases. According to OP, it's extremely common to find random per perfectly intact staircases deep in the forest. Most SAR officers are aware of them but will refuse to talk about them and under no circumstances should you ever go near them. These accounts of strange happenings really caught the attention of r slash no sleep and soon the standalone story became a whole series, each longer and more gruesome than the last. Usually I find it annoying when no sleep authors turn their otherwise good story into an unnecessarily long drawn out saga with like 10 parts but you know what? Search and Rescue gets an exemption because it's good. It's it's really good. <laughs> it's basically just a bunch of super weird and spooky bite-sized forest stories written in an easily digestible format with little lore tidbits sprinkled throughout. Did it need 8 parts? No, absolutely not. Do I still read through the entire thing at least once a year? Yes. It pioneered the genre of big list of spooky stuff that happened to me stories on No Sleep and whether that's a good or a bad thing depends entirely on your taste. Smile Dog. Smile Dog is a famous creepypasta which revolves around this photoshopped image of a Siberian husky with a human smile. Divorced from the context of the story, it's actually a pretty goofy image, but the fact that many of you will have had a visceral reaction to seeing it is a mark of how decent the storytelling is, at least in my opinion. The original creepypasta describes the image, smile.jp 
RPG, causing strange symptoms in anyone who views it from anxiety to outright insanity. The only way to stop it is to pass the image along to someone else, ridding yourself of the burden but cursing someone innocent. Those who have seen the image and aren't affected, i.e. every reader, are cleverly explained as having only seen a copy of the image. Only the original curse smile.jpg affects viewers. Honestly, believe it or not, I actually really like Smile Dog. It's surprisingly well written, it pretty seamlessly incorporates classic internet tropes into the story, for example the image spreading through 4chan and having to forward the image to others in a chainmail-esque fashion, and the story manages to make this stupid photo of a dog cheesing into something genuinely eerie, which is a feat in and of itself. I mean look at this. <laughs> Have you ever just stopped to look at the image itself? SCP Foundation The SCP Foundation originally began as a post on 4chan's paranormal board X. The post was formatted as a confidential file detailing a creature known only as SCP-173, a large concrete statue which had to be observed at all times as it would violently attack anyone who wasn't looking at it. SCP stood for Secure, Contain, Protect since it was the Foundation's job to secure and contain strange and often dangerous creatures and entities and protect the population. The post was short and sweet but the unique formatting opened the doors for other users to create their own SCP files and create their own creatures and entities for the Foundation to face off against. With the number of SCP posts quickly rising, a dedicated SCP wiki was created allowing anyone to create and submit their own articles to add to the SCP canon. The in-universe lore began to expand as users began to weave in their own interpretations and stories to explain the Foundation, its history, and its employees. Some of the most iconic SCPs include SCP-682 or the Hard to Destroy Reptile which is a giant lizard with a burning hatred of mankind who must be kept in a vat of acid to stop it escaping and wreaking havoc. There's SCP-096 or Shy Guy, a tall gaunt figure with pale skin who is docile and calm until someone views its face, at which point it will become agitated and viciously hunt down the person who saw it. Even if they're on the other side of the planet or deep under the ocean looking at a photo or video of it, it will hunt them down. SCP-1981, referred to as Ronald Reagan cut up while talking, is a videotape of Ronald Reagan delivering his Empire of Evil speech, except every time the video is played back, the speech deteriorates into a new string of gibberish and cut with disturbing quotes and predictions of future events, and Reagan begins to suffer from mysterious cuts and lacerations. And then there's SCP-3008, also known as the Infinite Ikea, which is pretty much what it says on the tin. A seemingly endless Ikea with no discernible exit, with faceless employees who will attack inhabitants during the night. As you can probably tell, SCPs are incredibly varied, with all manner of strange objects, creatures, and locations being kept in containment, and that number is growing every day. Naturally, being such a huge and successful collaborative writing project, there are countless stories, videos, pieces of fan art, and video games based on the SCP Foundation. And despite a few dramas and scuffles over the years, the Foundation and its many contributors are still going as strong as ever. Ben Drowned Ben Drowned, created in 2010, is one of the earliest and most influential ARG creepypastas out there. It tells the story of a haunted cartridge of The Legend of Zelda Majora's Mask, which is haunted by the spirit of a boy named Ben. Originally posted on 4chan, the OP would retell the story of his experience playing through the game, recounting various creepy glitches and strange pieces of dialogue, accompanied with photos and videos of his gameplay. Ben Drowned began as a simple creepypasta, but as it boomed in popularity, the later arcs began incorporating more ARG gameplay elements, with players interacting with in-game characters through various websites as well as collaboratively puzzle solving. The second arc took the story from a relatively basic tale of a haunted game acting weird and creepy to a far more grand, sweeping narrative about a doomsday cult stuck in a time loop. The third arc, which was released in 2020, follows a new character called Sarah who's trying to free the trapped souls of the characters within the game. Ben Drowned was one of the earliest creepypasta stories slash ARGs to heavily incorporate photos and videos. In an Arcade Attack interview with Alexander Hall, the creator of Ben Drowned quotes, Back in 2010, I think Slenderman was the only other creepypasta that was incorporating visual evidence alongside its written text. This gave the story and Ben Drowned a more grounded and reality feel and allowed the viewer to have an easier time suspending their disbelief. It also helped that back then there weren't that many people aware of how in-depth you could actually modify a Nintendo 64 ROM with GameShark coding tricks and some clever video editing, which I think worked in Ben Drowned's favour. Needless to say, Ben Drowned was ahead of its time and went on to influence countless horror ARGs and creepypastas, including iconic works like Petscop and Catastrophe Crow. Mouse.avi Once again, I'm going to be really quick with this one because YouTube doesn't like it when you talk about 
you know, which is fair enough. Mouse.avi is another very early and pretty influential Lost episode creepypasta alleging the existence of a cursed episode of Mickey Mouse which causes anyone who views it to uh, mick their mouse. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> the video supposedly depicted a simple loop of a somber Mickey Mouse walking which became more and more distorted and disturbing both visually and through audio with gurgling and screaming sounds playing throughout. The creepypasta ends with the author imploring readers to try and find the lost footage which resulted in many fake stories of internet denizens finding the footage, as well as fan-made mouse.avi videos on YouTube which I'm pretty sure fooled many a gullible child in the early to mid 2010s. Probably including myself, I'll admit it. Marble Hornets Marble Hornets is an online horror web series which was posted a few days after the original Slenderman creepypasta was created on Something Awful. The web series uses the Slenderman mythos to weave its own found footage horror tale of a man trying to find out what happened during the production of an unfinished student film called Marble Hornets. He gets a hold of the raw footage from the production and uploads them to YouTube as entries where he discovers that the cast and crew of the film were stalked by a mysterious and malevolent creature that they call the Operator, who is obviously the Slender Man stand-in, I mean he's a tall, faceless guy who uses proxies to do his bidding. It's Slender Man, it's just Slender Man. <laughs> The series gained a huge amount of popularity with over 100 million views in total and 87 entries, not to mention various side channels and sequel series. A Marble Hornets movie was even produced called Always Watching A Marble Hornets Story, though the reception was overwhelmingly negative. Marble Hornets was super influential in the creepypasta and particularly the ARG space. The found footage format and real-time updates were inventive for the time and the way that various accounts and channels would post in character as characters from the series would go on to become an ARG staple. As of 2023, no new video content has been released, but a Marble Hornets comic series is still in the works, with the fourth issue having been released in March of 2023. The Expressionless the Expression List was a creepypasta written by author T.J. Lee under the username Ivy Sir in 2012. It recounts the supposedly true story of a bizarre mannequin-like woman who stumbled into an ER covered in blood and clutching a kitten in her mouth which was lined with razor-sharp teeth. Her mouth, not the kitten. <laughs> in retrospect, I realized the way I phrased that sentence sounded odd. She was taken in for treatment but began fighting the doctors and nurses, horrifying them with her seemingly superhuman strength and violence. As one doctor shakily asked what she was, she replied, I am God, before massacring everyone in the hospital. Conveniently, there was one nurse who lived to tell a tale and creatively dubbed the woman the expressionless. The story is often accompanied by this image to illustrate what she looked like. This creepypasta is short and by today's standards pretty basic, which even the author himself admits, but it got popular just by merit of getting on the ground floor of the early 2000s creepypasta craze. And that's the end of the creepypasta iceberg part one. This entry covered all the basics, all the classic all the most iconic, silly, early creepypastas, which are kind of all my favorites. They're all goofy and unique in their own way, and they all went on to influence the entries that we'll see later on in the list in some way or another. I'm super excited to continue delving into this list. Uh, creepypasta was very much my speed back when I was a kid. I really, really loved it. I read it all the time. Even now, I still like to read it. I kind of like dabble in it a little bit because I like that 2000s nostalgia, but this has been super fun to cover, and definitely let me know if you have any creepypastas that you think I've missed on this iceberg so I can definitely add some more like later on down in the tears. Um, so if you have any ideas definitely let me know. If you have any um, I don't know stories of you reading creepypastas as a kid. Did you believe Lavender Town? I definitely did. Did you believe the expression list was real? I probably did, I'll admit it. I absolutely love hearing all of your stories and anecdotes, so please, please, please share them below. Let me know if there's any that you want me to add further down on the list, and in general, let me know if there's any other topics that you want me to cover in the future. Again, I'm really sorry about the uh, the lack of like frequency in my uploads, like things being a lot slower. I'm still working through some stuff and just kind of getting things back on track, but I'm super excited to be putting out videos, especially on creepypasta, one of my favorite topics for sure. Um, but anyway, yeah, I do apologize and I really hope that you'll stick around and yeah, I really hope to see you in the next one. Bye. A huge thank you to my Garfield overlords over on Patreon. Thy Heavenly, Brian Downey, Leanne O, 
Hazy, Oliver Brains, Blue Mayfeld, Michelle Olsen, Strawberries, Matt LRJ, A Riddle Wrapped in an Enigma Hidden by a Question Mark, Chicory, SHSL Sun Sun, Doug, Dana Homegardner, Charlie B, Simon, Xavier Araujo, Helm Hamburger Hand, Dozo Blint, Sheriff Whiskey, Astrium Vortex, Jesse Chisholm, Lee XX, Grip Gunderson, and Joe Bradshaw. Thank you guys so, so much for supporting me. It means the world. If you want to join these guys over on Patreon, the link will be in the description. And yeah, again, thank you so much for the support. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for being there. Thank you for everything. I, I genuinely can't thank you enough. <laughs> but I'm gonna stop thanking you because otherwise this video would go on forever. So thanks and I hope to see you in the next one. Bye.